Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to welcome you. It's great to welcome people watching online. Uh, we was, uh, Steve had just said to me, you'll know we're ready online because it'll appear on the little screen here. And lo, it did. The first thing you saw was the back of my head. So I'm sorry about that. If you're watching online, that's the way things happen. It's great to see you. If, oh, if you're a visitor, you're particularly welcome. You're particularly welcome if you manage to find your way here. We are very aware that finding your way into the building is uh, a major geographical achievement, really. We're thinking of issuing sort of phones with, uh, you know, uh, Google Maps and follow the route through. But uh, we are going to do something about that, which is real comfort to those of you who've made it today. But anybody who follows in your footsteps in another week might find it a little bit easier. Having said that, one of the first notices I want to give you is that in two weeks' time, and I hope you're listening carefully, in two weeks' time, we won't be here. we just like to keep you on your toes so you know what's going on. In two weeks' time, we're going to be at Chesterton because we're going to have a special service at Chesterton. Then we're going to have uh, a barbecue lunch. And then we're going to have an induction service for Sarah. So that's all happening at Chesterton. But when's that happening? In two weeks' time. Because I want to make sure you still remember to come here next week. So it's an interesting challenge getting all this sorted. And uh, next week, I will be asking for numbers because, strangely enough, my capacity for eating excess burgers and sausages is great, but I don't want it to be too great. So we need to get some idea of how many people are going to be there. And it's really just for the sake of my health. That's the main reason we're doing it. So, um, you know, I want to encourage you to let us know if you're coming, because if we cook for you and, you and then I have to eat your share, that would be terrible. Not for me, but, you know, I might explode. And that would be messy. So that's in two weeks' time. Next week, we are here in the normal kind of way. And there's a few notices. I send a, an email out each Sunday morning to tell you what's going on. And I try and repeat the important things from that. Today is Refugee Sunday. You can read more about Refugee Sunday on the link on the email. And a new membership course is starting this week. We're, when people are interested in joining the church as a member, we like to do a course to enable them to find out more about uh, the church itself and what membership means. If you're interested to know more about that, have a word with Steve, our minister who's sitting behind me, and he'll be pleased to give you all the details and to talk to you about that more. Um, then I think, yes, I think it's, I, I think it's worth advertising. This, is, this only happens once in a lifetime. Today, Songs of Praise at 1.15 is featuring Baptists. Some of you are impressed, some of you are very nervous, some of you are very worried. But it was uh, a program recorded at the uh, Baptist Union Assembly at Bournemouth. And uh, so there's a special program, Songs of Praise. Well, it's special to Baptists anyway, uh, at 1.15 today. And then probably the other uh, important notice to do is the second week running. I want to emphasize that we are in the process of looking for new members of the leadership team. And the information is all there in the email. But as I said last week, we do want to keep encouraging you to think about who you think would make a good leader at Orchard Baptist Church. And if you think of somebody who would do that, then have a word with them and see if they are thinking the same thing. My experience is that most of the best leaders we've had in churches I've been over the years are not people who stand up saying, please, please, I'd like to be a leader. They're the people who say, well, I hadn't really thought of it, but if you think, I will pray about it. And then often they come through and become really excellent leaders of the church. So if you're thinking of someone who would be really good as a church leader, do have a word with them and uh, talk about them. I've printed out a couple of nomination forms. Uh, they're on the table out there. Uh, that's, the, that's the sort of next part of the process if people want to pursue it. But it's really important that as a church, we are led by people who are committed to following Jesus and want to serve the church. And that's a great thing. But sometimes people need to be prompted to realize that's what God's calling them to. So do take part in that process, and we'll let, let you know more about it when we've got some nominations in. We'll look forward to receiving those. And I think that's probably... Thanks very much. Great to see you, and I'll hand over to Steve. Thank you, Stephen, and good morning, everyone. We're here this morning because of Jesus. We're here because God came to us in Jesus. Jesus lived among us. He taught us and showed us what God is like. And then he gave his life for us on the cross. And after three days, he rose again from the dead. 
and he has ascended to the Father, and now he is with us as we call on him. He's with us every day, every moment as we call on him. We're here because of Jesus. So we're going to celebrate the coming of Jesus in our opening song. Before we do that, we're going to share together in the Action Creed. And uh, if you would like to join with me in standing, if you're able, and those at home might like to share in these actions as well. So let's say together, and if you're able and want to, we'll do the actions together. We believe in God the Father, Almighty, who sent Jesus into the world. He came as a baby, born of the Holy Spirit, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, where he prays for us continually. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's continue to praise him with our opening song, Glorious Day. Oh, no. 
Let's pray together. Living God, we give you thanks and praise, for you have made us and given us life. You have redeemed us and set us free. Loving God, we give you thanks and praise, for you have found us and made us your own, named us and called us beloved. Accompanying God, we give you thanks and praise, for you have promised to be with us always, and nothing can separate us from your love. God, our God, we love you and adore you. Just as we stay in prayer, I just invite you for a few moments, and I invite those at home as well, just in God's presence, just to listen to what God would say to you in these moments. What does he want you to know this morning? What is he whispering in your mind? Maybe there are things that he's saying to you that are for other people as well. Is he telling you something that is for others, either here or elsewhere?
let's just stay quiet in God's presence for a moment. And I just wonder if anyone has something they believe God would want to say uh, to the congregation this morning. Something you feel that God has just laid on your heart for someone else that's here. And just speak it out where you are, or if you're at home, just put that onto the chat and I'll read that out. What was shared for those at home, we, we should rely on his thoughts, his ways, let go of unforgiveness, preconceptions. His ways are higher than our ways. Amen. Again, for those, those listening online, those sharing with us online, that this prayer that, that we will come to God, not, uh, not turn away, but come to him in our time of help, our time of despair. Continue to worship as we now share communion together. I'm going to hand over to Helen, who's going to lead us at this point. Good morning. It's really good to be with you this morning. Uh, aware of the children in our presence, let's um, come to communion with a, a heart for all of us having some understanding of what it is that we're doing here. Craig, I think I've got a couple of um, uh, slides. Thank you. Come, everyone who wants to. Come if you can recite or sign the creeds. Come if you can't remember the words to the Lord's Prayer. Come if you've been in church since birth and come if you've lost your way a few times but found your way here this morning. Come if you like to study theology. Come if you like to finger paint. Come if you are sitting in the rows at Cooper School or if you are sitting at home in your chair. Come if you like tradition and ritual and ceremony. Come if you like balloons and laughter and jumping in puddles. Come if you like all of these things and find the wonder of heaven in them all. Come as you are, old and young, one family, right now, each of you, every one of you, and have a seat right here at this table. It looks like bread. It is bread. But God is incredibly imaginative. 
And there is a surprise in this bread because within each crumb, God has folded nothing less than heaven. And when we break it, and everyone has a piece, what we're doing is saying, let's share together in the story of Jesus. It looks like a goblet of wine. And it is wine. But God being God, he didn't leave it there. And he has squeezed into each drop a promise for the whole world. And when we pass it among us and everyone has a taste, it sort of whispers to our souls and it tangles with our memories, telling us God loves us. God loves us. God loves us completely. So let's break bread with God and listen to the story and share wine and hear the promise. And as we listen, please could those who are serving communion this morning go up to the back and collect the elements and take them to each side. I think there's a picture of the night when Jesus and his disciples were sitting in a room, having a meal at a table that was spread before them. And they were all talking to each other about the days and the months that had passed. Peter remembered how he felt when he stepped out of a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and wanted to walk towards Jesus over the surface of what felt like. And, and then he talked about what it felt like when the water reached his ankles and his knees and his middle and then his neck. And Matthew recalled the change in his job and, his, and the change in his soul when Jesus came and asked him to put down the tax money and follow him. And Andrew interrupted Matthew to tell him about the time a boy gave Jesus two fish and five barley loaves, hardly enough for one meal, to feed a crowd of 5,000. And as the other disciples told of their memories of what happened to them and why they were following Jesus, Jesus himself eventually interrupted them all and said, here's another story. And he lifted the bread on the table. And he paused as everyone fell silent and he said, this bread, this is the most important reminder that you have of me. And I break it to show you that my own body will break. And I want you all to break this bread so that you know what's happening to me. And I want you to do it regularly, reminding yourself of me each time what I have done for you. Dying because I love you so, so much. And while the bread was passed, Jesus lifted up the goblet. This wine, he said, is another reminder of me. But it's a symbol that my blood will be spilled when I die. But don't be afraid, because tucked within this is a promise, a covenant, that I will be with you wherever you go. I will never let you go. Friends, he said, I love you so much that even death cannot separate us. And again, Jesus passed the wine around to them all, and they all took a sip. And today we share in that very same meal, as Jesus did with his friends, the bread and the wine that remind us of our stories of Jesus and what he did for us because he loves us so much. This is my body, says Jesus. Eat it, all of you. This wine is my blood, and within it is the promise. Drink it, all of you. 
And as Jesus commanded us, so we do that now. And I invite you at home to take your bread and your wine and eat and drink. And for all of us here this morning to go and uh, share with the service in the bread and the wine.
another word to, um, to share that came in on the chat, um, which is be patient. I am molding your focus. That might be particularly relevant to someone. Be patient. God is molding your focus through what you're going through at this time. Well, we're going to take family news before the children go out to their, their groups. Is there any news we would like to share with each other today? Very quiet. <laughs> Nothing? Stella, you'll be six this week. Fantastic. What day this week? Do you know? Is it Friday? We think it's Friday. Grandparents think it's Friday. <laughs> Happy birthday, Stella. Have a lovely birthday. We hope you really enjoy it. And we hope your grandparents know on the day what day it is as well. <laughs> Matt. Are we outing? Are we into outing people again now? Happy birthday, Philip. Is it your birthday soon? <laughs> it's Matt's fault. Happy birthday to Philip, anyway. Great. Lucy. On Father's Day? On Friday. On Friday, sorry. Friends left her school for Belly. Oh, they did, didn't they, Lucy? Yeah, because quite a lot of your friends left, didn't they, on Friday, Lucy? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that must have been very sad, Lucy, to say goodbye at school with them. Yeah. Thank you, Lucy. Well, the children are going to go to their groups now. Let's just pray for the children and the youth as well. Father, thank you for all our children. Thank you the noise they make, the joy that they have. Thank you that they um, are so important to us as a church and the life and light that they bring to us. Our prayer for each one of them, our prayer for our youth as well, Lord, is that each one will grow in their knowledge of you, um, in their relationship with you. And to this end, Lord, we pray for them. We pray for them in their groups this morning, but also in their lives day by day. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So if the children would like to go, we'll see you at the end of the service when we have refreshments. I'm going to hand over to Stephen, who's leading our prayers of intercession this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful we can come to you confident that you hear our prayers, confident that anything that is on our minds is already on your minds, because you know us and you know your world. As we pray this morning, we ask that you direct our thoughts and our prayers and help us as we pray day by day and week by week. Help us to know the things that are on your heart and to align our hearts and minds with yours so that we can pray your kingdom come and your will be done. As today is World Refugee Sunday, we do pray for those who have taken every risk to leave the place that they know and love because they're fearful. We pray particularly for those who have done that because they're followers of you and they felt their lives threatened and there was no future for them where they had lived and where they had grown up. Father, we pray for them. We pray that you would comfort them. We pray that as they call out to you today, they would know that you have heard their cries. And we pray those cries would be answered by those who are able to bring real help to them. We thank you for so many around the world that work so hard to bring love and concern and compassion to those who fly in terror for their lives. We thank you that your church is often at the forefront of that. We pray blessing on those who work in your name to bring help and hope to those who are so feeling so hopeless, feeling that all the possibilities of life have gone and they have to leave their home. 
We pray too for those who face persecution, who remain where they are, fearful for what might happen to them. We pray this morning for those who've gone to church and have had to endure the looks of people as they've gone past and know that uh, they may well be uh, the possibilities of attack. We pray for them. We find it hard to imagine what it would be like to worship in that situation where people around are so hostile to, uh, to you and to you, those who follow you. We thank you that so many are so brave and so courageous. We are encouraged to hear their stories of the way in which they stand for you where situations are so difficult. And we pray for them. And then we pray for those who as refugees have left their countries and are looking for help elsewhere. And we recognize there's been so much controversy in our own country about how they're welcomed and how they're received. Father, we pray that this country would be a country that treats refugees with compassion and concern. We thank you for those who give unstintingly of their time to do that. Even just reading about churches that would have been supporting refugees in this area in Oxfordshire this morning. Father, we thank you for those. And we pray that this country and the people of this country would continue to be welcoming people, keen to find a way of sharing what they have with those who have so little. And we pray for those who take decisions that affect the policies. We pray they would be given wisdom uh, and compassion. We recognize there are many people too who are, have fled in their own country. They don't leave their country, but they move somewhere else, sometimes hundreds of miles within the country borders. Many have lived in camps for year after year after year. Father, we recognize this is not how you intended human life to be. And we pray for those who do all that they can to make that situation different. But above all, perhaps, we pray for those who have the power to change things. Those who fight wars when there's no need to fight wars. Those who refuse to talk about bringing peace when they could do that. Father, we pray that you would intervene in those situations and there would be peace where there has been conflict and there would be safety where there has been fear. We recognize too that some of us have problems much closer to home and perhaps they loom very large on our horizon. We thank you that you're concerned about the big issues of the world, but you're concerned about each one of us. And this morning we pray with those who are present here or watching online, who are carrying a big burden, something that's concerning them so greatly. Maybe it's the health of a loved one or their own health. Maybe it's concern about their children. Whatever it might be, Father, we thank you that you know these situations and we join with those people and lift them to you and ask that you'd give encouragement where encouragement is needed and you'd give peace where peace is needed and you'd give strength where strength is needed. We pray for our young people. We pray particularly for those who've just finished uh, their slog through exams. And Father, we pray that in this period now waiting to know what the results are, they would be uh, opportunities for celebration and there'd be confidence that their lives are in your hands. And we thank you, Father, that their value of each young person does not depend on their exam results. But we thank you that uh, there are so many opportunities in our society for people to make progress. And we pray for each one of our young people, they'd be able to move on to the things that they have in mind uh, the further studies or whatever it might be. And we pray for blessing on them. And we pray that they would know you in these times and be encouraged by you and strengthened by you. And so we think of this town of Bista, we think of our society, and we pray that each one of us would be encouraged to reflect your values and to live out your values in our society. We pray that this town would be one where people uh, respect one another show care for one another, that it would be a pleasant place to live. And we pray that you'd enable us as a church to continue to grow, to work together, to celebrate together, to see your kingdom come as we seek to follow you. And we bring all these prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Stephen. Just uh, to flag up being Refugee Week, we have a special service planned. I think it's the 11th of September. It's a date. I was looking at Stephen and Mary, but 
<laughs> no, no, Stephen doesn't know. 11th of September, we are hoping to have a bilingual service, or certainly some elements of bilingual service, with the Hong Kong uh, settlers in Bicester. So a lot of Hong Kong people have come over um, to the UK. Quite a few have come to Bicester. We've got Sharon Sheck coming, and we've got to work out the details on that, but just to flag that up at this point. So we're hoping for a very special service on that date. Well, we're going to look at God's Word together. We are working our way through the Sermon on the Mount, um, and today we come to Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 26, and uh, this is Jesus on murder. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown in prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. So, Father, as we we spend moments time thinking about these words of Jesus, we pray that your spirit will touch our hearts and draw us more and more into your plans and purposes for our lives. In his name, amen. In 1992, a cricketer named Bryn Derbyshire, who'd been given out leg before wicket, reversed his car at high speed at the umpire, who hurt his arm as he leapt clear. Members of the opposing team came to the rescue and one smashed the sunroof of Derbyshire's car with a cricket stump. In court, Derbyshire, aged 37, admitted causing bodily harm by wanton, furious driving after the match between his team, Old Park of Nottingham, and a side from Blythe, Nottinghamshire. Nottingham Crown Court gave him a three-month suspended sentence and ordered him to pay compensation of £400. The umpire, called Joseph Purser, said afterwards... I stand by my decision, he was out. (laughs) How do we deal when we are upset with others? How do we deal when we're angry with others? How do we handle disputes, whether they're justified or not? Having told the crowd that he hadn't come to tear up the Old Testament law, which is what Paul talked about last week, but to fulfill it, Jesus now says... In words that he's going to repeat six times in pretty quick succession, as we'll see over the coming weeks, he says, you have heard it said, but I tell you. And what he's going to do is he's going to tell them how they can truly fulfill the Old Testament law, not just the letter of the law, but actually the purpose behind the law. And he begins in our passage today by exploring and expounding the sixth commandment. Let me just read the first couple of verses again. You've heard it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. God's purposes for our relationships, Jesus is saying, actually goes beyond simply not killing each other. He has a bigger plan for our relating to one another. Sadly, some people don't even manage into not killing each other. Some people uh, and some gangs, even some countries, we resort to this because we cannot handle our disputes. But Jesus says God not only wants us to avoid murdering others, he actually has positive. He wants us to enjoy good and healthy relationships with each other. He wants us to speak well of others. He wants us not to rubbish others or speak or to run them down. He wants us to solve problems when they arise. He wants us to keep short accounts 
in our relationships. And there are these three statements in verse 22 that he says. First of all, he says, I tell you that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. There are two words used regularly throughout the New Testament for anger. One is a it's like a short outburst of anger. Um, it tends to be used in those situations when maybe you trap a finger in a door or maybe when someone runs into the back of your car because they've been driving too close and, and you get angry. You have this short burst of anger. The second word, which is the one that's used here, is more often used for sort of a, a deep-seated, a settled anger. If you like having a grudge against someone, harboring resentment where the anger is long-lasting and we've allowed it to settle in our hearts. And anger in itself isn't always wrong. In fact, sometimes it's right. It's wrong not to be angry at times. When we see injustice, when we see abuse, when we see discrimination, when we see bullying, we should get angry. And Jesus got angry. And, uh, and actually, if you, uh, you'll find, if you do some research on this, that there are some manuscripts that said they add some words in here. Um, and they have put the words without cause. I tell you, anyone who's angry without cause with a brother or sister, because they wanted to emphasize that actually um, it was the anger without cause. However, they're not in the original. The, the original uses this word that's about, that's often used for harboring resentment. And I, I think what we have here, what Jesus is referring to, is not all anger, because some anger's right, but it is that deep-seated anger where we hold a grudge against someone, where we wish them ill, and it's a settled position in our heart. And then he says, in verse 22, he says, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court, is answerable to the community. Now, I don't think any of us will have been guilty of this one, um, Raka, probably not in your vocabulary. This word Raka is an Aramaic term of insult. It's thought to derive from a word for empty, and the idea that someone is empty-headed is probably the closest uh, analogy that we have in English. Um, we might say the lights are on, but no one is at home is a similar sort of insult. And then the, the third thing that he says here, anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Uh, this is where we get our English word moron from. Uh, it's a great joy when, when I learned Greek to learn some of these words. And, uh, and for those of us that remember the 70s and jilted John, he thought that Gordon is a moron, is what he sang. Um, I suspect jilted John harbored some settled feelings of resentment against whoever Gordon was. Each of these statements has a punishment or, or a, a, um, a consequence attached, and these become more severe. He says, first of all, that they will be subject to judgment if you're angry. Then he says that they'll be answerable to the court. And then he says, in danger of the fire of hell. And, and whilst these escalate, the actual offenses don't seem to get worse. So I, I don't think it, that these offenses are, are related one-to-one -one with the the consequences of the offences. I think actually what, what is being said here is that all of these things, anger, hatred, insulting others, writing them off, is a very serious thing, culminating in the threat of eternal judgment. And whilst we know it's right not to murder, Jesus also says we mustn't destroy others with our anger or our words. The Apostle John writes in, in 1 John 3.15, anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. We are not to destroy others with our language. We're not to destroy others with our thoughts, with our conversation that, that actually uh, denigrate them. So we're not only to obey the letter of the law, Jesus says, the sixth commandment, but we are to obey the spirit of the law, which is about learning to live in harmony with others. And then in the second half of the passage, Jesus is encour encourages us to go to any lengths necessary to keep our relationships sweet. And he puts before us two scenarios. Let me read these again. Verses 23. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary, with your enemy who's taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. 
Where the, uh, in the first little bit, the you, we don't get this in English, the you is a plural. Here, the you is singular. It's almost that Jesus is honing in that actually you are to do this individually, personally. You are to make every effort to settle difficulties and disputes in your relationships. You're to take responsibility for this. One of these scenarios, it talks about a problem with a brother or sister. People in our group, it might be someone in our church, and our family. Um, for the Jew who was hearing this, it, they would have thought about fellow Jews. It was a common term to talk about our brothers and sisters being fellow Jews. The second scenario is about an adversary, an enemy. And for the Jews, they would have thought about the Gentiles here. But people who aren't in our, our group, people who aren't in our clan. One scenario is in the context of worship, bringing your gift to the altar. The other scenario is on the way to a court. Two very, very different scenarios. And no matter how we are, we are to seek good relationships with our friends and enemies alike. We might think when we think of going to court, we might think of the recent court cases of Colleen Rooney and Rebecca Vardy or Johnny Depp being sued by Amber Heard. And, uh, and Jesus says, no matter how confident you are of winning or how right you are, it's probably better to settle it before you get to court. I think uh, they might have heeded this advice well in both these cases. After all, we could lose more than we bargained for. The second scenario here is about mending relationships with those who are our, our adversaries those who are our enemies, and this is a really difficult thing to do. There will be some of us in this room that know that there is someone in our lives, in our sphere, that actually we find it really difficult to get on with. And how are we to be reconciled to them? How are we going to do this? This is hard. It takes courage. It involves actually taking risks. According to Grammar Munster, two Irish families, the butlers of Ormond, and the Fitzgeralds of Kildare were involved in a bitter feud at the end of the 15th century over which family should hold the position of Lord Deputy. This tension manifested itself with violent fighting between the two families. Realising the violence was getting out of control, the butlers took refuge in the chapter house of St. Patrick's Cathedral. The Fitzgeralds followed them into the cathedral and asked them to come out and make peace. Afraid they would be slaughtered, the butlers refused. As a gesture of good faith, the head of the Kildare family, Gerald Fitzgerald, ordered that a hole be cut in the door, and this is the door. He then thrust his arm through the door and offered his hand in peace to those on the other side. Upon seeing that Fitzgerald was willing to risk his arm by putting it through the door, the butlers reasoned that he was serious about peace and they shook hands through the, through the hole. The butlers emerged from the chapter house and the two families made peace. The door, this door is known as the door of reconciliation and it is on display at St. Patrick's Cathedral. And this is where the expression to chance your arm comes from. Whenever we reach out to an adversary, to someone who we have a problem with or they have a problem with us, it involves taking a risk. It involves chancing our arm. It's not easy to do. It might not work. It might be thrown back in our face. We might even get hurt in the process. And yet this is what Jesus asks us to do. Jesus teaches that what the law requires is is more than just not murdering people, but actually to try and seek to be in good relationships with people, even our enemies. And we are to take the initiative in this. We are to go to the person directly and seek reconciliation. We cannot guarantee it will work, but our duty before God is to try, to chance our arm. Now, for some of us, this seems impossible. We've been so badly damaged by others, so hurt by what they've done to us that we couldn't possibly envisage taking such risks. All I can say is that that the Lord knows that. He knows what we've been through. He knows how we've suffered at other people's hands. But also, he doesn't want us to settle in a place of anger and bitterness to others. And even if we aren't able at this point to seek reconciliation or even to forgive, 
we can begin by praying and asking God to bless the other person. Hello, Aria. <laughs> it's so nice to see you. I was just having a look at everyone. She's fine there, Elizabeth, yeah. So even if we can't do this, we, we can begin. Actually, I would encourage you, if you don't feel you can do that, if that's too difficult, actually pray for the other person. Pray blessing on them. And, and if you can't pray for the other person yet, pray that God will help you to pray. Pray that he'll help you to get to that point because we cannot simply settle in harboring resentment. That's what Jesus teaches us here. There's a really well-known story by Corrie ten Boom. I want to repeat this because this is a, a really helpful story, I think. She had the challenge of forgiving a former guard from the concentration camp where she was and where her sister died, who, having spoken in a German church about forgiveness shortly after the war, this guard came up and actually uh, put out his hand to shake hers. This is what she writes. She said, Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. And now he's in front of me, hand thrust out. A fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that, you, that, that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And she says, I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my wallet rather than take that hand. He wouldn't remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among those thousands of women? But I remembered him. It was the first time since my release that I'd been face to face with one of my captors, and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard in there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time, he went on. Sorry, but since that time, I've become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I'd like it to hear from your lips as well. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? And I stood there. I, whose sins had every day to be forgiven, I could not. Betsy had died in that place. How could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand, hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. And still I stood there with coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of my heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand, I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out for me. As I did, an incredible thing took place. The current in my shoulder raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. And for a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. I tell you that story because by God's grace and his enabling, we can forgive even our fiercest enemy. The other scenario that Jesus mentions, the first one, is, is one that tells us that reconciliation, good relationships, actually take precedence over worship. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar and go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Ugandan bishop Festo Kivangero tells how he's on the way to preach after having a big row with his wife. The Holy Spirit spoke to him, go back and pray with your wife. He says he argued with the Lord, I'm due to preach in 20 minutes, I'll do it afterwards. Okay, said the Holy Spirit, he heard, you go and preach, but I'm staying at home with your wife. Reconciliation takes precedence over worship. I, I've preached on this passage several times, I've not realized till this time that actually the, what Jesus says here is quite absurd. Because Jesus is speaking, oh, we're going to play guitar now. <laughs> what Jesus is speaking is, uh, is actually speaking in Galilee. 
He's speaking in Galilee. The altar is 80 miles away in Jerusalem. And Jesus is saying that you will have traveled all the way to Jerusalem. You will have gone 80 miles to Jerusalem, brought your gift to the altar, presumably got to the altar. And actually, when you're at the altar, then you would have bought an animal and put it on the altar. And then you suddenly realize that someone has something against you. Not even that you've got something against them, but someone's got something against you. So then leave that animal you've just bought for sacrifice, go back, what is a three-day journey, back to the person who's got something against you, sort it out, then come back again six days later now. Your animal that you've left there, presumably, hopefully, just... Uh, I was going to say, for animal cruelty's sake, we, we would want that, that animal to be um, well-fed and watered and that you've looked after it. Then come back and then offer it on the altar. That's not so good for animal cruelty's sake. But come and offer that animal as a sacrifice. It's quite absurd, isn't it? Six days later. But actually, that is how important it is to have reconciliation, to have good relationships. This is the priority that we must give to sorting out problems in our relationships, even when they are not our fault. So the sixth commandment is not merely fulfilling, fulfilled by avoiding murder, but it is fulfilled by seeking to maintain good relationships with others, whether they're family, friends, or even enemies. We cannot allow anger and bitter resentment to have any settled place in our lives as we follow Jesus. And it just brings me to very quickly a last point. We need to do this because the stakes are high. It's what Jesus says. We've already mentioned this escalating consequences that he, he mentions, culminating in being in danger of the fire of hell. This language here is language that, that is uh, depicting God's judgment it's very graphical language, that language that was known at the time, of actually the coming judgment that we will all face. And it's a graphic image of, of the God forsakenness. If we don't do this, actually, we, we stand that we will be on the wrong side of that judgment. We see a similar dire warning in the last verse at the end of the passage. Jesus says that the judge may throw us into prison until we have paid every last penny. And both these warnings from the lips of Jesus tell us that maintaining good relationships with others is not an optional extra. This is something that we need to do. This is the kingdom. It's about good relationships. It's about us knowing God, but also living in harmony with each other. This is, isn't something we can just ignore and go on and worship God. Actually, this is absolutely fundamental to our worship of God, that we maintain, we do all we can, to maintain good relationships. The urgency of this is that hating others, unforgiveness, holding grudges, running others down, damages, affects our relationship with God. And we mustn't allow it to do that. It is vital we do all we can, that we live in harmony with our friends, with our family, and even with our enemies. And in this way, we fulfill the sixth commandment, do not murder. Let's just have a moment to, to pray in response. And as we've been talking, that there might be some of us here, we are thinking of, of certain people that we know uh, we have a difficulty with, a problem with, and there might be very good cause for that. And I invite you just to, to talk to the Lord about that now. And if you, if you need to do something or say something to them, then, then just make that pledge to God. But you might not be able to do that. You might actually just need to pray blessing on them, knowing that's all you can manage at the moment. Well, just do that. But there might be some here today, you can't even pray blessing. Just pray for yourself that God will lead you to that place. Father, I, I pray for your grace, for your ability, like we heard in that story of Corrie ten Boom, Lord, where she, she offered forgiveness and, and found your enabling grace as she did that. Lord, help us that we will not let bitterness and anger and resentment, bad relationships in any way continue. 
Help us not to settle in that position. But let us embrace what Jesus teaches. Lead us, Lord, where we need to, to forgiveness. Help us where possible, Lord, to find reconciliation. And may we fulfill what you want for us in our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As the band come forward, um, just as they do so, we're going to sing a song in, in response. And uh, I thought on this topic, it sometimes is really helpful to have something to remind us of what we, we are praying. And I've got some stones. They've got some very simple words, peace, love, hope, and joy on at the front. And, and if you feel that in response to, to what Jesus has taught us that you need to do something, I would invite you just to come forward and, and take a stone. We've said that the cameras are going to be just on the worship band, so they won't see who's coming forward at, at home. Come forward and take a stone. Put that in your pocket. And if you've said that, actually, I need to go and talk to that person, keep it in your pocket or in your purse or handbag or wherever you want to, and leave it there till you've done it. Or if you know that you need to pray for someone, if you've said, actually, I need to be praying blessing on this person's life. I can't, can't reconcile at the moment. Again, if you want to come, take a stone, keep it there. And then actually, when you get home, you keep that stone until you've done the promise that you're making to God this morning. So come just as you want to, freely come forward and come and take a stone if you would like in response. Let's, uh, let's all stand. We're going to sing together. And it's God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. We do this in his strength as we respond to him this morning.
Father, we pray that, that more and more we will be those who worship you with the whole of our lives, with, with our actions and our words, day in, day out. And so help us, Lord, as we go into this coming week, help us to worship you in the way we treat others, in our forgiveness, in our pursuit of reconciliation. Lord, we bring you our worship. We thank you for all you've done for us. We bring you our worship. And to just close with a, a lovely hymn, one that we've learned over the past couple of years. And it, uh, it begins, Yet not I, but Christ through me. It does begin by this, by the way. Those who got thrown by the last song, I, I announced the wrong song that we sang, but this one is this one. Yet not I, but Christ through me. Let's make this our prayer as we close our service. anyone to pray with you there'll be people at the front so please do utilize them they'll be available to pray after the service refreshments at the back of the hall if you're able to stay with us um, and if you want we'll leave the stones here if you didn't want to come up in front of other people but would like a stone just come 
and take one of those stones as well. And we, we trust that God will help us as we seek to live in harmony with others. So may you be strong to grasp with all God's people what is the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ and to know it even though it is beyond knowledge. And from that love, may you live a life of love, able to forgive others and walk in peace with all people. Amen.